Hello and welcome to an exciting lecture in behavioral neuroscience. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the structure and function of the nervous system, part one. I have broken this up into two parts, and each of these parts is relatively short because it is just dense and full of material. So in this part of the chapter, we're going to cover the nervous system, an overview. We're going to look at neurons. The different types of neurons. We're going to look at the supporting cells to the neurons. We're going to talk a little bit about the blood brain barrier and then we'll get into how neurons fire with the action potential ions and firing rate. And then in part B we'll get into some more stuff relating to um, the, the firing of neurons and how that works. So first before we get into anything we need to talk about the nervous system. The nervous system and this should be basic stuff stuff you learned in intro so this part shouldn't be anything new um, once we get into some of the more specifics from the neurons that might be new to you but for this we're going to just talk about kind of the the overview of the nervous system there's two divisions of the nervous system there is the central nervous system which includes the brain and spinal cord and then there is the peripheral nervous system, which is everything outside of the brain and spinal cord. And the central nervous system communicates to the rest of the body via nerves. Both of these contain nerves. They contain different types of nerves or slightly different types of nerves. But the, the communication goes from the central to the peripheral and from the peripheral to the central. It's a two-way street. Speaking of nerves, when we're talking about nerves, we're actually talking about bundles of neurons and multiple bundles of bundles of neurons. So a nerve consists of a sheath, sheath of tissue that surrounds or encases a bundle of individual nerve fibers. And these nerve fibers are the axons, axons of which we'll get to in a minute are looking at basically the body of the the neurons when we get to the neurons within nerves there's also blood vessels as well so the blood vessels are providing nutrients there and then as as it says here within here you've got bundles of axons and you've got multiple different bundles of axons in each nerve so the nerve is actually responsible for many, many, many neurons. It's composed of many neurons. When we are talking about the types of neurons now, so now we're in inside of those nerves into the neurons, we've got afferent or sensory neurons. Afferent or sensory neurons are ones that go from the senses so let's just talk about the one in the picture here you've got from the senses from the fingertip but sensory neurons come from any of the senses it, it, all the way to all the touch sight hearing all of those have sensory neurons that that are processing the sensory information the sensory information then goes down the the neuron um, or down a series of neurons down the nerve to a, a point where it gets to the spinal cord and then so this is this is in the peripheral nervous system until it gets to the spinal cord and then you have what's called interneurons and the interneuron is right here it's what's in it looks like gray or green it's in green the interneuron goes between the sensory neurons and the motor neurons. The motor neurons, on the, on the other hand, are the neurons that then go from the spinal cord or the brain to the muscles. So you've got three basic things that are three basic types of neurons, sensory neurons and motor neurons and the interneurons that connect them. The sensory neurons are about receiving in information the motor neurons are about sending out instructions. So each of these neurons performs tasks that are essential tasks, such as perceiving and learning, remembering, 
deciding con and controlling complex behaviors. So even all of these are in the brain as well that are going on that are basically determining behavior, thoughts and behaviors. So this slide might be a little bit confusing and it's not in your book, but when we're talking about structural classifications of neurons, there's three main things that fall into. There's actually some others, but we're just going to look at the three for, for now. Um, first is unipolar. So unipolar is going to be this one here. And with unipolar, it is basically where the, the one stalk um, divides into an axon and a dendrite. So you've got the soma here. So the soma is what's important. You've got the soma here. Then coming off from the soma, you have one continuous stalk that is, or one structure that connects the, the terminals, terminal buttons to the dendrite. So you've got the, both ends are on one stalk. With a bipolar, as you see here, what you get is the soma is connected in the middle and you've got two branches coming off from the soma. One is going to the terminal buttons and the other is going to the dendrite. So it's, it's basically the axon is coming off from one side of the cell body and the dendrites coming off the other. Whereas the unipolar, the axon and dendrites were both off from this on the same line. Then in the final one, multipolar, which you've got over here, you've got actually the cell body here. And off from the cell body, you've got one stalk that's going to um, the, the axon. Um, it could be to multiple different terminal buttons, as you see here. But the point is, is that you've got multiple different branchings of dendrites coming off from the soma, as you see here. So let's look at these, the neuron, and let's look at the main parts or main components of the neuron. We kind of already talked about this, but let's describe what some of these are. So first you've got the soma here. The, the soma is the cell body. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit bigger than I circled. It's basically everything encompassing there that's not the dendrites, that's not the branches off. So technically it comes all the way like that. But the soma is, it houses all the major organelles, nellas, um, that are involved in regulating the function of the cell. It receives signals from other neurons. It is basically the, the housing or the cell body of the neuron. Then you've got these dendrites. The dendrites are going to be the things that receive signals from other neurons. So in this uh, multipolar here, these dendrites are going to receive signals from multiple different other neurons. Then we'll go with the axon. The axon is what goes down from the cell body to the ends, to the terminal buttons. Um, and surrounding that is the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath, which we'll talk about later, it is basically fatty globules is the best way to, to explain it that cover parts of the axon they don't cover all of it that's very important if they covered all of it the ac the, the neurons wouldn't fire but they cover most of it with gaps and then finally at the end you've got the terminal buttons which are the things that are basically sending the signals to the other neurons then you see the direction of the message. It goes from the dendrite to through the axon to the terminal buttons. When we are talking about the um, basically the cell, the neuron, this the the cell of the the neuron. Um, there's some things that are important components of it. First, you've got the outside at the top. In the inside at the bottom and you've got what are are referred to as ion channels that are going between 
and we'll talk later about the specific ions in a few slides we'll talk about the specific ions because different ion channels work for different specific ions um, in this it's just talking about one it's just referring them as one type of ion but these these different channels guide different types of ions through and what you see here is an open ion channel over here that is allowing ions through and a closed ion channel here which is not allowing ions through and we'll talk about how neurons firing are based on um, the ion channels being open or not. Okay, this slide has a lot of dense information. We're not gonna go into it much more than this. I'll just briefly explain what each of these is. So you've got the nucleus, the, the, the basically the center of the the cells the center of the soma the the core of the soma so to say and this contains the genetic information that directs the neurotransmitter synthesis it's basically the 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 core is the best way like i already said so it, it is what controls the cell then you've got the rough endoplasmic reticulum which is basically on the surface and it makes neurotransmitters so it's a, a membrane on the surface that that makes neurotransmitters you've got the smooth endoplasmic reticulum which then moves neurotransmitters away from the rough endoplasmic reticulum you've got the golgi apparatus which transports neurotransmitters to the other parts of the cell You've got the lysosomes. I'm always bad with pronouncing certain things that basically act as an immune system for the cells, just like they do anywhere else. And they, they will fight off foreign bodies. And, and then you've got the mitochondria and I'm just don't need to know much more about that. So, like I said, this is a lot of dense information. I'm not going to refer back to any of this later other than possibly the RER and the SER simply because and possibly the Golgi apparatus because it, it works with neurotransmitters but those are the three things that are working with neurotransmitters the rest of it I'm not going to refer back to it's just important to know the structures of the cell as far as when I give uh, an exam I'm not going to necessarily expect you to remember these. A good question might be, all of the following have uh, are responsible for something to do with neurotransmitters except X. And I might say the nucleus, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, and the lysosomes. So um, one of those doesn't have to do with neurotransmitters. The others do. That might be a question I might ask. I told you I'd come back to this. So the myelin sheath is um, the thing, the fatty substance that surrounds the, the axon of the nerve. Um, so when, let's say you get a stimulus that's going through the axon, it basically as the the electrical signal is going through the it, it in a sense weakens as it's going under the myelin sheath the myelin sheath has an advantage we'll get to that in just a second but it the action potential weakens as it's going through it um the then when it gets to the the nodes of Ran, ranvier i am saying that wrong but I just cannot pronounce it right now, sorry. But when it gets to the nodes, it actually is regenerated. So it increases in strength again. And this will kind of go counter to something we're gonna say later, but just keep in mind that, that where the myelin sheath is, it's actually the, the signal decreases in strength as it's going through the myelin sheath and then regenerates when it gets to the nodes that are between periods of myelin sheath. However, the myelin sheath plays a very important role. Otherwise, wh why would we have it? The role is, is it speeds up transmission. Even if the strength of the signal gets weaker as it goes through it, 
the signal goes faster. That's because the myelin sheath squeezes or constricts the axon to be smaller and it forces the, the signal to go faster through it. So when, when neurons have the myelin sheath, they, are, they fire faster. And that'll be important later when we talk about brain development. And one thing I'll say right now um, that's, that's kind of relevant to this is the last parts of the brain to develop is basically what is going on is it's the last parts of the brain where the myelin sheath finishes um, accumulating or building up or um, appearing. However you want to say it, the myelin sheath is still developing there. And the parts of the brain that are the last develop, to develop, what is going on is the, the neurons are there, but the myelin sheath isn't as thick or as good there up until you're in your 20s. And we'll come back to that later, but just as a preview, the last area to develop in the brain is the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain responsible for decision making, uh, making rational decisions, things like that. Let's talk about some things tertiary to the neurons in addition to the neurons. So these are cells outside of the neurons that basically aid or assist in the neurons. And I apologize if I pronounce these uh, jumbled. Um, I always try to pronounce them right, but my mouth doesn't necessarily work right. So first we've got astrocytes, then we've got oligodendrocytes, then we've got radioglia, and then we've got microglia. Um, We'll talk in a couple different slides about the the astro and the oligodendro, but the the radioglia basically protect the neural tube during um, the nervous system development, and the microglia are the immune system of the brain, and, and engage in uh, phagocytosis. Again, I told you that my mind sometimes doesn't want to, well, my mind can say it, but it just sometimes doesn't want to come out of the mouth. It's almost like a, a stutter. Um, so the, these last two are basically for protection and immune. They're, they're not as much concerned with the actual neurons or the way the neurons work. Whereas the astrocytes are concerned with the way the neurons work. So these actually physically support the neurons. They're what hold the neurons in place, hold the neurons up, and they transfer nutrients from the blood vessels to the neurons. The blood vessels do not connect directly to the neurons. The blood vessels connect to the astrocytes. The astrocytes then convert those nutrients, transfer nutrients um, from the capillaries of the blood vessels to the neurons. However, we're going to talk about something in a minute because blood doesn't even directly touch the astrocytes either. It touches the capillaries of the blood vessel. So we'll talk in a few minutes about the blood brain barrier and how um, getting things necessarily to the neurons and, and to the central nervous system and to the brain and things like that is much more difficult because of this barrier this blood-brain barrier. If you get, if you have damage to your, your neurons, the astrocyte also um, forms scar tissue in the nervous system. So this is where you can have, especially in parts of the nervous system where you have, where you, you if you have neurons that are severed, that you, you don't get, um, that they can't really form back up. It's usually because of scar tissue that they can't reconnect. And the scar tissue comes from this astrocytes. There's actually really interesting research going on in how to remove this scar tissue so that the, the neurons can heal and they're actually in neurons and nerves can heal and they're actually having success healing spinal injuries. The oligodendrocytes are also a tertiary, tertiary cell that aids in neurons. And basically, this is the thing that this is what creates the myelin sheath. So this it's it's 
basically the myelin sheath is 80% lipids, 20% proteins, and it is supported and created by the oligodendrocytes. Um, and again, like I, I've already talked about the myelin sheath and how what that does. So this, the, the oligodendrocytes are very important in that they, they produce or create the myelin sheath. Now we have to talk about, so we're talking about the oligodendrocytes. We have to talk about those versus swan cells. So actually the oligodendrocytes only work or only are in the central nervous system. So they provide myelin in the central nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, we have what's called swan cells and they make the myelin sheath out there. So and you can kind of see from these images the difference how the the oligodendrocytes are working on multiple different nerves at the same time whereas the swan cells are, are essentially working on one nerve and and building up the myelin sheath around that one nerve i already talked about this a little bit but the blood-brain barrier is important. That is because the the, um, the 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 capillaries um, in the cells that are outside the brain they allow through, or they have gaps that allow through substances, and they allow. And basically, these these substances, these gaps are are of a specific size. So the the permeability of of essentially um, different uh, substances whether they can get through the blood vessels depends on where they're located the capillaries in the brain are much smaller they're they're very small the capillaries in the body are much bigger evolutionarily this makes sense because you don't want foreign substances getting in the brain that could easily kill you however because of this, it actually makes for, it causes issues. So the capillaries in the, the rest of the body, except the brain, except the central nervous system, specifically the brain, um, they, they allow a lot of substances through. So if you're given a, a medication, if you're given a drug, if you're given whatever it is that, you're, that is injected into your blood, it can then make it through these capillaries and get to the different parts of the body, including the nerve cells on the, the, the different parts of the body that are in the central nervous system. However, because the capillaries in the brain are so much smaller, you the, the medication that you're given can't necessarily get to the brain. So they have to come up with different types of medications to essentially make up for this. Uh, for example, Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease affects the brain. Um, and different parts of the body. Um, Parkinson's disease is usually due to a degradation of the, the dopamine pathways. Um, so there's a deficiency in dopamine. Why can't you just give a patient dopamine? Well, because dopamine is actually too large to cross the blood brain barrier. So there's a drug they found that, that it called L-DOPA um, it can cross the blood brain barrier and then once it gets across the blood brain barrier it can be converted into um, dopamine so this this um, they basically and the what converts it you actually have to it's another part of the drug that you're given is something that converts it so these two different drugs you're given these and they they cross the blood brain barrier because they're small enough and once they're across the blood brain barrier it then gets the stuff gets converted to dopamine so the brain has the dopamine it needs to basically counteract parkinson's this is just one example but when it comes to especially neural disorders and neurological disorders that we talk about later in the semester the the blood brain brain barrier poses a big challenge to treating these All right, now we're going to transition into, for the second half here, 
into action potentials. So action potentials are pretty simple, pretty basic. They're the electrical impulses that travel down the axon and lead to the release of neurotransmitters from the axon terminal. Um, if you've already done the discussion, which is about neurotransmitters, we're actually not going to talk about neurotransmitters this week. We're not going to talk about those until chapter four, but we will be, we will be covering and we'll look at an overview of them. We'll kind of talk about what they do. We're just not going to talk about the specific neurotransmitters, but the neurotransmitters are what's responsible for the communication between neurons. So when you've got a neuron, You've got an action potential that goes from the, the dendrites down the axon to the terminals. This action potential um, moves the electrical charge basically from one neuron to another. And once it gets to the end, it, it releases neurotransmitters into the axon terminal. That axon terminal, those neurotransmitters then go to the dendrites of the next neuron and pair with that which caused the next neuron to fire and the action potential goes down that so if you have an electrical impulse that's basically the the what is going on with the neuron let's look at it from more of a scientific perspective when we're talking about the the electrical so as I already said the message is conducted along the axon the axon at rest has a negative charge which we'll get to in just a second um, you've got um, the resting potential when the axon is at, at rest. And then what you're going to have is what's, what's considered a threshold of excitation. The threshold of excitation that you see here, right here, is the level that the, the electrical current needs to get to for the, the neuron to fire. And then the action potential, once it fires, travels like a wave followed by a rapid burst of depolarization, well, starting with a rapid burst of depolarization, followed by hyperpolarization. So let's look at that. So first you've got your resting potential, then you've got depolarization. This is where you've got a reduction in the membrane potential. What's happening here when we talk about ions in a little bit is the ions have, have switched sides and you've got the polar, the, 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 um, neuron is no longer polarized. It's depolarized. There's too much negative on one side or positive on the other side or a combination of both. The, the, it then fires and you've got a repolarization with the firing followed by a hyperpolarization where you've got an increase in the membrane potential and you see that it comes all the way down here with hyperpolarization down to below the resting potential. So the, the, the charge um, becomes um, much more uh, to the negative side with hyperpolarization. Uh, should point out, depolarization is when the um, neuron itself is positively charged. You've got a negative outside, the neuron itself is positively charged. Then the repolarization is where where it comes back but then before you get back to resting potential you actually have a period of hyperpolarization where the neuron has is negatively charged and finally the neuron returns to resting potential very complex sounding thing but it's pretty simple on the surface when we talk about it a little bit more, we'll look at what's happening with, with ions and what's causing this depolarization and hyperpolarization. So when we're talking about ions, we have to talk about the extracellular and the intracellular. The extra intracellular is going to be within the cell. The extracellular is going to be outside the cell. And what is important here is that there's four different main types of ions and these four ions are basically going to be moved by diffusion and electrostatic pressure so diffusion is basically where where cells want to want to spread out evenly electrostatic pressure is where cell cells with different charges will be attracted to each other and cells with the same charge will be pushed away from each other 
You have organic ions, anions, which have no charge. You've got chloride, which has a negative charge, and sodium with a positive charge, and potassium with a positive charge. And we'll, we'll talk about what's going on here, especially with sodium and potassium. Before I get to anything else, the most all of these are important, but the most important are that is this sodium and potassium. Um, it's why if you have a sodium deficiency or a potassium deficiency, it can give you headaches, it can give you muscle aches, it can give you various different things. It's because what's happening is is your your neurons are deficient in these ions, and it's causing basically issues. It can cause you to have mental fugue. Um, be dizzy, all these different things that can come from a deficiency. You can also have an overdose of both of these that can cause issues as well, but you're much more likely to have a deficiency of one or the other. Before we get any farther, I misspoke on the previous slide. Um, anions typically have a negative charge. Um, it's a weak negative charge, but they typically have a negative charge. So we looked at the, the cell itself earlier, but now let's look at these ions when it comes to the cell. So on the top, we've got the outside of the cell, and on the bottom, we've got the inside of the cell. Um, when we're talking about the, the outside of the cell, we typically have low concentrations of potassium. We have higher concentrations of chloride and sodium. And if anything, the, the, the chloride is causing an electrostatic pressure to, to pull, in some ways, the sodium out. Um, but the sodium still has this force of diffusion and electrostatic pressure to try and get inside the cell. And in a minute, we'll talk about the sodium-potassium pumps and how, what's going um, on with that and how um, all of it's basically getting, or a lot of sodium's getting pushed out because of that. Okay, um, so what's going on in the cell though? You've got these um, or organic anions, you've got higher levels of potassium, and lower levels of chloride and sodium. And Potassium is trying to itself trying to get to the outside by diffusion, but it's being held in by electrostatic pressure. And I, I should go back to sodium. Sodium is, is being pulled in by electrostatic pressure and in some ways out by the by the chlorine, but it's still being pulled in by the electrostatic pressure. And diffusion is trying to get it in because there's less inside. Same with potassium inside, it's trying to get outside because there's less inside. That gets us to the sodium-potassium pump. Um, the sodium-potassium pump is basically continuously pushing sodium out of the axon. Um, it's, some potassium is going in, but it is continuously pushing sodium out. And actually, most of the neuron's energy, 40% of the neuron's energy, is, um, is done with this pump. This pump is basically going against some of the, the things that are, are trying to occur, like um, diffusion. It's, it's going against diffusion, but it is what is basically keeping the sodium mostly outside and the potassium mostly inside, at least when it's at resting potential. We will talk more about when it's at action potential, but when we're at resting potential, sodium is, is more congregated outside and, sodium, and potassium is more congregated inside. So when we're looking at this, this force of diffusion that we've been talking about is the movement of molecules from regions of high concentration to low concentration. The molecules are at attempting to obtain equilibrium, this balance. When a neuron reaches its threshold of excitation, 
it triggers the action potential. And what ends up happening there is the force of electrostatic pressure are, are working when you get certain things like openings to pull these neurons, or these, not these neurons, these ions to where they're going to reach equilibrium. So the force exerted by attraction or repulsion is electro electrostatic pressure and it moves ions from place to place. So what ends up happening is, is the, when the, the action potential is triggered, when it reaches the threshold of excitation, the sodium channels open and the sodium enters the neuron. So this isn't the pump, the sodium potassium pump we were talking about. This is just channels from a, from like eight, 10 slides ago that we were looking at where we're, it allows things through. The pump pushes things through. The channels open to allow things through. So as the, we, we reach the, the action potential, the, 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 the point of excitation, the, the, it's not coming to me, the threshold of excitation. Once we reach the threshold of excitation, what ends up happening is, is the sodium channels open up. And now because the, the, the sodium is trying through diffusion and electrostatic pressure to get from the outside to the inside, sodium rushes into the, the neuron. Then as the, the, it continues to ex, uh, excite and the neuron gets a um, positive charge, as I said before, so the neuron becomes positive during depolarization. As this depolarization occurs and the neuron gets a positive charge, the potassium channels open up so that potassium can exit through diffusion and electrostatic pressure because now the potassium wants to get to the other side. Then once it's reached its peak, those sodium channels close, sodium is no longer entering the neuron, but the potassium channels remain open. So in this case, potassium is still coming out. And in the end, the sodium and potassium pumps work in overdrive to return the neuron to its resting potential. I hope that makes sense. Um, as it's going down here, the sodium, uh, the potassium channels are closing slowly. When it's at the top and starting to go down, they remain open, but they slowly close, slowly close to the bottom till we get close to the bottom and then they're completely closed and the pumps, then we're, we're down here where they're closed and then the pumps return us to normal resting. And that's how you get when the, the sodium's all inside, you're getting this positive charge. When the potassium all gets outside, the, the neuron gets a positive charge. Or negative charge. Sorry, I misspoke there at the end. Let me just restate that because I misspoke. When the sodium is all rushing inside, the neuron gets a positive charge. When the potassium is then all rushing outside, the neuron then gets a negative charge. When it returns to normal, it's basically got a neutral charge or a slightly negative charge, but it's only a slight negative charge. By the way, if you want to get technical, that slight negative charge at the beginning is actually one of the things that allows the neuron to fire faster by allowing that extra electrostatic pressure from the, the sodium to be pulled inside because the neuron inside has a slightly negative um, pressure or slightly negative charge. So let's look at the action potential again, but now when we're talking about it in terms of these ions, so it's caused by a brief increase in the permeability membrane to sodium, sodium is allowed in, then a brief increase of permeability to potassium, potassium is allowed out, and the, the neuromembrane contains 
literally thousands of ion channels. So there's a lot of these channels where things are flooding through. And the action potential results from the opening and losing of ion channels and the distribution of ions. So that action potential that's coming through is causing that firing based on the switching of the charge of the neuron based on sodium being let in and then potassium being let out. So the last thing we're going to talk about here is the conduction of the action potential. So we've got axonal conduction, which is as an action potential travels along the axon, it remains constant in size. The axon potential doesn't increase, decrease, it remains constant in size. This kind of goes counter to what I was saying earlier when I was talking about the myelin sheath and how it gets weaker when it's in myelin and stronger when it's out. But that isn't referring to the action potential size, that's just talking about how strong or how weak the electrical impulse is. Um, wh what is the this action potential though stays the same size. If an axon branches, it splits, but it doesn't get smaller. It normally travels one way, there's some instances where it doesn't, but the action potential remains the same as it goes throughout the system. However, the action as it goes throughout um, the, the, the axon, I shouldn't say the entire system, as it goes throughout the axon. So the next neuron might have a different threshold, but that specific neuron, it doesn't change as it's going throughout. There's what's called the all or none law. So when the all or none law means was is basically a neuron fires or it doesn't. It, it fires and it stays the same, it stays constant, or it doesn't fire at all. You could have a electrical charge that's 99% of the way to firing and that neuron's not gonna partially fire. It's gotta get 100% of the way to firing and then that neuron fires. And finally, you've got what's referred to as rate law, which we'll talk about on the next slide, which doesn't refer to how strong the, the, or the, the action potential size, it's referring to how fast the firing occurs. So the size remains the same as it travels down the axon, but things can affect basically the strength of it and the, the um, rate of firing. Let's look at rate of firing. So if you've got a weak stimulus, basically a weak stimulus is going to have a slower rate of firing. It's going to reach the threshold less frequency. That's what's important here. It still has the same exact threshold. When it fires, it still has the same exact action potential. It just is reaching the threshold less, less often. When we talk about neurotransmitters and all of that, um, in the next set of slides and in, in the future, we'll talk a little bit about that, why some are weak and some are strong. Strong is basically a faster firing rate because it reaches the threshold more frequently. But we'll talk about how when it comes to neurotransmitters, how it has to, a, a, the dendrites have to receive so much stimulation essentially to reach the, the excitation threshold if there's fewer coming in, or if there's something blocking those neurotransmitters coming in, that means it's going to reach the threshold less often, it's going to fire less often. However, something with faster, it's got either more neurotransmitters coming in, or less blockers, something like that, and basically it's going to fire more often. So we're not talking about strength when we're talking about rate, we're talking about frequency, how often it's, it, it fires. So in review, we talked about the nervous system um, and we looked at an overview of it. We talked about nerves and neurons. We talked about some of the supporting cells transition into the blood brain barrier and looked at how that affects nerves. And then we finished up with some action potential and the ions and how that, that is related to that. Finishing with when we're talking about action potential, firing rate, which we'll come back to later. I know this was exciting stuff, and the next part is just as exciting. Thanks, come on back.